here we go on to the final exam. I, I hope you're all doing okay, but, but this is the final recorded lecture. Uh, so uh, let's get to it. All right, so uh, starting from, let's look at question one. Starting from long run equilibrium, an increase in aggregate demand increases output in the short run, but only increases prices in the long run is, is the answer. So that's, uh, um, that's the classical, the only increases prices in the long run is the classical dichotomy. And indeed, uh, it can, uh, you know, an increase in aggregate demand can indeed increase output in the short run. Okay, what about number two? Which of the following is not one of the themes for fostering long run growth? So um, let's look at the things that are, first of all, allow creative destruction, dismantle privilege standing in the way of growth, support uh, science. Uh, those are all things I talked about in restoring American growth, if, if you watch that video. And one thing I didn't talk about was about reducing inequality to raise aggregate demand. The reason is because, I mean, reducing inequality can be a good thing, but uh, it's not necessary for aggregate demand if you can just cut interest rates. Okay, so let's go to number three. Um, this is definitely good to know. We had fast economic growth from 1947 to 1973. And then from 1995 to 2003, and then it was slow between 73 and 95, and it's been slower again uh, since 2003. Uh, well, actually, this is not just economic growth. This is more specifically technological progress. And so this is one of those facts about history that I want you to know, just like the fact that there was the great inflation in the 1970s and the Great Depression in the 1930s and the you know, the Great Recession and its aftermath starting in 2008. Okay, question number four. Which of the following sectors has had a notably slow measured rate of technological progress since 1947? This is something I had you read about. Construction has had a remarkably uh, low rate of technological progress. Information technology, that's like computers, that's gotten a lot better. Uh, equipment and consumer durables, we've actually gotten much, much better at uh, making washing machines, refrigerators, um, a lot of other types of consumption we've gotten better at, but, and farming too, we, we can produce a lot of food. Uh, the, uh, you know, not all of it totally healthy, but uh, a lot of food, and, uh, con but construction has had almost no measured technological progress. I mean, maybe, maybe there's a bit of progress that's not super well measured by the statistics, but if you, if you look at how houses are made, they're not made that differently than they were a long time ago. All right, on to question five. Which of the following is not a quotation from Bonnie Cabusi's tweet storm on restoring American growth? Let's first look at the things that are. Total GDP matters for military power, and one way to increase it is more immigration. You know, our, our technology basically tells us what per capita output we can have, but if we have more heads, capita is Latin for head, if we have more heads, then the same per capita output is more total output. Uh, B, manufacturing is going the way of agriculture, producing a lot but not employing a lot of people. That's something I've emphasized throughout this course because it's economically a big feature of the period of time you are living in right now that we need fewer and fewer people to do manufacturing. And of course that feels very wrenching to people who are used to the idea of manufacturing jobs. Uh, jumping to D, it's important to focus on productivity area in areas that are the biggest parts of people's budgets. I've emphasized that throughout. E, I don't care if it's in GDP or not, it's economic growth. If we get for people more of what they want, that's uh, 
you know, that's very helpful when you when you come to say environmental issues. Um, you know, if you get a better environment for people, um, that is like more output and properly measured, it is more output, but GDP has various flaws in it and things that are just left out. Okay, so what didn't I say? The bailouts in 2008 were a big mistake. If we had had a rule against bailouts, we could have avoided the financial crisis. This isn't uh, something I believe at all. I think once you get to the point of you're gonna crash the economy even worse, if you don't do a bailout, you should do a bailout. What I've, what I've tried to emphasize is you, you avoid bailouts by having high capital requirements, by requiring that banks and, and all other firms too, but especially banks, get a bigger fraction of the, the funds they're working with from stockholders rather than borrowing them. And, and the value of that is the stock, you know, the value of stock can go down without bankruptcy, without interfering with the things the bank is doing. But if a, if a bank goes bankrupt, um, it's, it's very inconvenient when a bank goes bankrupt. All the other banks get scared of dealing with that bank, so there's contagion, there's a, there's a, a big to-do when a bank goes bankrupt. But if it gets a sufficient amount of money from stockholders, then, you know, okay, the value of the bank goes down, so the stockholders take a hit. But end of story, nothing else terrible happens. So I, I've argued that, the, that you should do bailouts when you have to, but you should avoid bailouts by not putting yourself in that situation, by not letting banks borrow too much money. And, you know, of course, uh, uh, it, one thing that you have to remember is that taking on bank deposits is a form of borrowing money. So if, if banks take on bank deposits, they, uh, that should be balanced out by uh, a certain amount of uh, stockholder equity. But, you know, those are, deposits are a little less dangerous because the government guarantees them. Okay. So six, which of the following is not one of the basic arguments for preferring nonprofit sector action to government action in many areas, given in how and why to expand the nonprofit sector as a partial alternative to government, a reader's guide. So let me again, focus on the things that I did say, because those are some of the things that I want you to learn. A, because the nonprofit sector is more decentralized, it involves a more diverse body of key decision makers, and so can be more creative. So you don't have to be too negative about government to say, look, their own, you know, government has a high degree of centralization. You just get more ideas in the nonprofit sector. B, in the nonprofit sector, it's easier to sunset programs that don't work well than in the government. People can stop donating to them. And if you look at the government, you know, though people talk about it sometimes, the number of times that a government department gets, uh, gets abolished are pretty few. Sometimes they get recombined in various ways, but whether things work or not, the programs keep going forever it, as, as a rule. C, a nonprofit sector provision of public goods tends to be cheaper since wages in the nonprofit sector tend to be lower than in the private for-profit sector, while government wages tend to be higher than in the private for-profit sector. So this is, this is something that showed up more and more recently that government wages are higher than the corresponding private wages. But if, if I remember correctly, I think this is especially true at the state and local government level. So it's not that, that uh, federal government wages are especially high, though, though it might be true in some areas. I, I think that people who are um, mail carriers, for example, are very happy with the wage that they're getting from the government compared to uh, if, if for some reason they got cut off from their job as a mail carrier and had to find a private sector job, I think that would be tough, but I don't think it's primarily a federal government issue. I think the, the state and local governments tend to pay people more than they get in the private sector. D, even, so, so it's just cheaper to help people out 
by charity in the nonprofit sector than by charity through the government. D, even if giving to some charity is required, giving to a charity one's choice is much more fun than forking over taxes to the government. Therefore, people will distort their behavior less to avoid required charitable donations than they would to avoid taxes. So here I wanna emphasize, you know, people hate taxes for a lot of reasons. Uh, obviously, one reason is less money in their pockets, but people find it, many people, not everybody, but many people find it like a, like, like, like very aggravating that the government is taking their money because the government is taking power too. So it's not just, so requiring people to donate to charity uh, or else you, you pay taxes or you donate to charity, uh, that doesn't take away all the power. It takes away some power. It takes away the power to spend that money on yourself, but it doesn't take away all the power. And, and you know, sometimes, in fact, I think the government does even more to make people feel annoyed at paying taxes. You know, the government should needs to make sure that certain things are done, but it should be as graceful as possible at getting money from people to, to, do, to get those things done and, and maybe requiring them to give to charity is one way. It, there are other things that won't work for everything because there are some things that are not popular to donate to, but still need to be done. National defense is, might be an example of that. And, um, so, um, uh, you know, so the government definitely needs to do some things, but even if it takes money to directly spend itself, it should send people thank you notes, for example. Um, maybe have a, maybe have a dinner for the, the, the people, the, the individuals who paid, the hundred individuals who paid the most taxes, honor people who pay taxes. Don't treat people who pay taxes like scum. It's ridiculous. If people pay taxes, they should be honored for that. It's a wonderful thing for people to pay taxes. The government should darn well recognize that it's a wonderful thing for people to pay taxes and, and sound a little bit more grateful. I mean, use a little basic psychology in trying to avoid having people avoid paying taxes too much. All right. Um, the, uh, you know, uh, before I move on, I mean, if I go back to C, there's, uh, you know, too often when we want to help people, it turns into, oh, be, be, you know, trying to help the people who help the, the folks who are in desperate need. And of course, everybody, you know, it's, it's nice to, to try to figure out how to help everybody, but, but we should notice the difference between you know helping somebody who's desperately poor and helping out the social worker who helps somebody desperately poor for example you know and and it's not like you know the social worker might be moderately poor too and so it's not like it's a terrible thing to help them out but just in in, in terms of priorities just realize the difference between desperately desperately poor people and, and folks who are uh, a step up from that or two steps up from that. Okay, what did I not say? Uh, through E, through cognitive dissonance, many who are required to give to charities will get closer to being rational economic actors who put an emphasis on personal self-interest. Well, you know, I said the exact opposite of this. I said through cognitive dissonance, uh, people who have to give to charity probably will go down the road of saying, hey, I'm a good person because I'm supporting these charities. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, why, why emphasize the fact that the government forced you to do that? Um, so I actually think being, you know, really goaded to give to charities is, is likely to make people, you know, go in the direction of Trump, of, of saying, well, I wanted to give to charities. And if they go in that direction, maybe they actually will want to give to charities more. And I think that's a good thing for people to uh, move in the direction of thinking of themselves as the sort of person 
who, who gives to charities and, and it may lead them to do other good things that aren't uh, you know, required or strongly incentivized by the government like that. Okay, on to question seven. Which of the following is not a quotation from international finance, a primer. Here, I think the things I did say are uh, a little less interesting, but what did I not say? The Chinese government is guilty of many things, but currency manipulation is not one of them. No official action of the Chinese government is directed at affecting the exchange rate for yuan. Well, this is just totally false. And I would, I would not say this. The, the Chinese government has been manipulating the exchange rate. And I, in particular, I view the purchase of foreign assets by an arm of a government as currency manipulation. To me, that's, that's pretty much the definition of currency manipulation. Now, one thing that annoys me is people talking about monetary policy, like changing interest rates as currency manipulation. No, you got to change the interest rate to do monetary policy. And you can't change an interest rate with having an effect on, without having an effect on the exchange rate. But that's not the main purpose. The main purpose is to get aggregate demand right. And, and if you happen to have a closed economy, changing the exchange rate would get aggregate demand right without causing a change in the net exports. But okay, that's just part of what happens when you change the interest rate. So I definitely don't view interest rate policy as currency manipulation, but I do view direct purchase of, of foreign assets by an arm of the government as currency manipulation. Now, on to question eight. I'm sorry that this uh, somehow the, the copying was not high quality here, but I think we can barely read it. Which of the following is not a quotation from supply and demand for the monetary base, how the Fed currently determines interest rates? The one that's not a quotation is, in addition to the Fed or other central bank, actions of private banks add to or subtract from the monetary base. No, I emphasize the monetary base is types of money that are directly created by the central bank and directly, therefore, the quantities are directly under their control. The monetary base is, is just um, reserves plus paper currency. And when I say paper currency, I do include coins. And in some countries, you know, they're made of pla they're, they're plastic bills. But, uh, you know, the Fed directly creates reserves. And, uh, you know, paper currency is only given to the public when the Fed says so. You know, the Mint does print it, but it sends it straight to the Federal Reserve banks after the Mint prints paper currency, and it only gets out to the public when the Fed says so. Okay, question nine. Uh, which is a fo following is not a quotation from what monetary policy can and can't do. So here, uh, um, actually, this is pretty interesting. What, first of all, what I didn't say, in the short run, central banks can control inflation but can't control the nominal interest rate. No, in, in, in the short run, they cannot control inflation, and, but they can control the nominal interest rate and through it, the real interest rate. So that's exactly the opposite of how I describe things in the short run. Um, Okay, let's look at the other things I did say. People can know things in some sense, but ignore them because the cost of meaningfully and appropriately using that information in decisions is high. Okay, that's, uh, that's important to know because it's the difference between information and information processing. Imperfect information is actually well understood by economists. Imperfect information processing we're very, very bad at modeling that. I mean, almost all our models, for us to know how to do the models, we have to assume people are infinitely intelligent, but they're not. Uh, meaningfully and appropriately using information is hard. Uh, answer C, in relation to the majority of macroeconomic models, one of the big mysteries of the Great Recession was why inflation didn't fall more. Uh, now we're, it's a mystery why inflation doesn't rise more. Uh, and I argue that imperfect information processing can be part of the, in, uh, the explanation. 
Fed says the target is 2%. So people, if they're a little lazy and thinking about what will happen, they, they think, oh, it'll probably be close to 2%. And of course, there's a partially self-fulfilling prophecy here, but I wanna, I, I, I tend to, you know, think there are a lot more partially self-fulfilling prophecies than totally self-fulfilling prophecies. You know, somebody's, somebody's um, kind of making a mistake here, but it, it's in the, you know, it, it's easier to get away with those mistakes because they are partially self-fulfilling. Uh, yeah, so, so some people act like, oh, inflation will never go up. No, 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 D, it's like, okay, if you have unemployment equal to half a percent for 10 years, I promise you, you're gonna get more inflation. Uh, in the long run, central banks can control inflation pi and through it the nominal interest rate I, but can't control the real interest rate R. I've emphasized this a lot. Uh, they can control inflation in the long run, but not the real interest rate. Okay. Uh, so, you know, the Fed is not on the hook for why pension funds are not earning more. That, that has to do with sub supply and demand in the market for loanable funds. Okay, this, the beginning of this last year's exam was, was quite heavy on these critical reading questions. Let's go on to 10. Which of the following is not a quotation from should the US dollar be weak or strong? Uh, D, if the dollar gets weaker because US technology has improved, that's a bad sign. Uh, actually, that's definitely not something I said because typically the, you know, I would never say this because technology improving is so wonderful that that's definitely not a bad sign. I mean, you know, if you go back to the question about, you know, the, the history of technology, uh, you know, people were very upset that that, that things didn't look so good from 1973 to 1995 when technology was growing more slowly and people haven't been too happy since 2003 either, though many people blame it on things other than technology, but it probably, a lot of it is the slower growth of technology. So, you know, technology improving is a great thing. As I emphasized before, in the short run, it doesn't look quite as wonderful if you don't do your monetary policy right. But if you have good monetary policy, even in the short run, technology improvements are wonderful. Okay. Um, 11, which of the following is not a quotation from how increasing retirement saving could give America more balance trade? Let, let me first go through the things that I did say. Automatic enrollment in retirement saving plans is so powerful that some economists will worry it'll exacerbate the global glut of saving. But if you have low enough interest rates, you can deal with that extra saving. Um, the, uh, you know, is where I went with that. Uh, C, for a country running a trade deficit as the U.S. is, the only way to get more balanced trade is for us to you know, make it easier for foreigners to get dollar denominated loans to shift your net financial investments towards lending to foreigners. What's the remedy for unbalanced trade? It isn't trade restrictions. Remember, those don't even change the level of net exports. Running a chronic trade deficit results in less employment in a way that goes beyond the business cycle. Notice that um, these effects are there even in the long run international finance diagram. You know, if you don't save, if you don't invest in the long run, well, particularly if you don't have net exports, that, that will have an effect on employment. But B, what did I not say? Many policies have been tried, but there's no government policy that can appreciably affect the saving rate. The, the, whole, the whole article, the whole column was about a government policy that can affect the saving rate. All right, on to question 12. Which of the following is the most basic rule in the international capital flow framework that I talk about in my interview with Alexander Trenton? Um, 
okay, the most basic rule, and this is not a, this is something that I did say, governments would have to get approval from the other country for an arm of the government to buy assets that are denominated in another country's currency. Uh, and another, you know, if it's both of their currencies, like they both use the euro, then okay, then they can buy those assets. But, and, and it's not that they can't do it, it's that they need to ask permission. I'm not a fan of capital controls that would discourage households from investing in foreign assets. I'm, um, I, I'm, I, I like a sovereign wealth fund and other countries shouldn't have a, uh, have a veto on that. Um, you know, no other country should have a veto on our national saving. And, and I certainly don't want to, other countries to have a veto on negative interest rates. All right. Which of the following is not a quotation from Orrin Cass on the value of work? So uh, let's take a look. Uh, what's the one I, I didn't say? or that wasn't said in there. Karl Marx speculated that workers with leisure time would spend their time sleeping and watching TV. His other 19th century predictions didn't all come true, but he was right on this one. So I hope you notice, well, I don't know if you know this, but Karl Marx died in 18, a long time ago, before there were any uh, television. So he wouldn't have made that uh, prediction. Uh, all right, so. What, what was said here, whether people are, and how people are employed is both an economic and cultural question. I mean, work is important um, to give meaning to people's lives. Unemployment, many uh, see unemployment more than any of life's other rust patches leads to unhappiness and breakdown. Uh, you know, and that's true in the economics of happiness. Some of the data suggests that unemployment is especially un unpleasant. Uh, work determines whether we feel respected or admired. You know, self-esteem is important. And, um, and there is this, uh, this interesting fact that he claims that um, actually folks who have a lot of money are, uh, often seem to be more in favor of redistribution. Uh, you know, that might not be true everywhere, but that's probably true in the United States. Okay, question 14. Which of the following is not a quotation from why we want more jobs? Well, let's, what I didn't say was no one has ever argued that a recession was caused by people suddenly deciding they hate working more than they used to. Actually, uh, Prescott said exactly that. Uh, so you might think it would be so silly that nobody would ever say that, but I talk in the article about how Prescott did say that. But let's also look at the things I did say. Inside the models taught in principles, people don't want more jobs. If anyone worked anymore, it would be too much. Um, the Fed could drive unemployment down to 1% for a while, but if it did it for 10 years, you'd probably go into hyperinflation. Uh, you know, when and I define why we want more jobs as wishing that more jobs weren't so inflationary. And, uh, and, but there are other policies. Monetary policy can only do so much here, but there are a bunch of policies that can get us closer to the ideal job level and get some of the extra jobs we want. Antitrust to reduce the degree of imperfect competition and get prices down closer to marginal cost. Uh, lower marginal tax rates that make workers get after-tax wages closer to what firms pay. Ways of putting fear of the boss into workers or getting workers to work hard on the job that don't depend on losing a job being a terrible thing for a worker. So, you know, monitoring instead of unemployment. Okay. Now, of course, monitoring instead of unemployment is one of the themes in, uh, the, in uh, the reading for question 15, which of the following is not a quotation from Janet Yellen is hardly a dove. She knows the U.S. economy needs some unemployment. Okay, so um, a lot of things I did say. The thing I didn't say is one of the things that can really hurt the motivation of a worker is being under the threat of deportation. Well, fear of deportation could actually make them do what the boss wants. You know, that could be a very strong motivator. 
uh, what else did I? It, okay, so let's look at some of the things I did say. If all jobs had advancement possibilities, that could motivate workers. Uh, but but um, if doing what needs to be done on the job could be made more pleasant, then you don't you know it would reduce the need for the carrot of above market wages. Um, if people, workers could trust firms not to cheat them, and then they, if workers were required to pay for their jobs, they'd be afraid of unemployment. Uh, they'd be, sorry, they'd be afraid of losing their job even if there were no unemployment because you immediately find another job, but you have to pay for it. Trouble with having workers pay for their jobs is they're going to worry that the firm will make them pay for their job and then would pr promptly fire them just to get the money. Uh, to make workers, E, to make workers care about bottom of the heap dead end jobs, Employers have to keep raising their wages above what other firms are offering until work, workers are expensive enough that there's substantial unemployment. That is, at first you can, you know, for one firm, they can raise their wage above the other firms, but then the other firms try to match that at least, or, and then go a little bit above. And the need for getting the wages up only stops when you have this unemployment, which makes the firm scared. Okay. Let's see, let's go on to question 16. Which of the following is not a quotation from the government and the mob? Uh, allowing blackmail is actually economically efficient. I definitely didn't say that. But what did I say? The basics the government must provide to make anything close to market efficiency possible, blocking theft, blocking deception, blocking threats of violence. Um, you know, D is, is um, actually expanding on one of those. There's this silly idea that the free market requires tolerance of corporate deception. You know, cor corporation companies don't have to lie to get a good economic outcome. In fact, when companies lie, it gets in the way of good outcomes. So requiring companies to tell the truth is very often a good, uh, a, a good rule. They, you know, but some people lump all regulations together and they say, oh, regulations are bad. Well, no, the regulations that say you have to tell the truth are not so bad. You know, some of them we, you know, we call laws against fraud, but, you know, it can be useful to add to the uh, narrow laws against fraud with regulate other regulations that require companies to tell the truth. Okay, let's look at B and C that I did say. It's exactly such social engineering to prevent people from stealing, deceiving, and threatening violence that result, give the good results from the free markets. It's not that free markets give you good results if people can steal and deceive and threaten violence. Uh, C, designing strong but limited government that will prevent theft, deceit, and threats of violence without perpetrating threat, theft, deceit, and threats of violence at a horrific level is quite a difficult trick. And this is why many countries are still very poor. It's not easy getting a good government in this sense, getting a, a government strong enough, but also weak enough. That's a very difficult trick. Okay, question 17. Which of the following is not a quotation from one of the biggest threats to America's future has the easiest fix? Uh, okay, so, um, you know, politicians, one thing I did say was politicians try to call everything an investment. You need to have a little bit stricter rule for some, whether something's an investment than that. If um, uh, what I didn't say was ever since 1990, Japan has let its infrastructure go to rack and ruin. It's really quite remarkable how much uh, Japan has invested in its roads and bridges very different from the United States. And I, I emphasize that in the article. Uh, okay, I did say if experts agree that an expenditure will raise future tax revenue by increasing GDP, then it belongs in the capital budget. Um, you know, if it's a, really a one-time expenditure, maybe it can go in the capital budget. I could say that in D. And, uh, you know, roads and bridges are important, but you have to weigh that against uh, against research and development as something the government might, might want to put money into. 
and uh, uh, you know, research and development can be all kinds of things, curing disease, but also how we can teach math better is an example I gave. Okay, la last uh, of these uh, critical reading questions, there, there was a lot of this because uh, uh, last year I had a, a very large number of reading assignments. Okay, let's um, take a look at question 18. Which of the following is not a quotation from the real test of the December 2017 tax reform will be its long run effect. Okay, what I didn't say, the effects of changes on capital taxation on the economy are quick. That even contradicts the title here. You know, that I definitely didn't say that. Well, what did I say? Solar growth model is a mainstay of intermediate macro classes. That is true. It's in almost all the textbooks for intermediate macro. Um, the, the, the idea of cutting corporate taxes, or the, one of the main purposes is try, to try to get more investment and therefore a higher capital stock. Um, the, uh, you know, that's kind of what D is talking about too. And um, the tax reform itself raises after tax interest rates. Okay. Because basically it's an increase in the demand for loanable funds, shifting the investment curve right. So it's an increase in the demand for loanable funds, which raises the real interest rate. All right, we're done with that type of question, I think. I, I don't think I had more later on in the exam. Now we get a different kind of question, 19. The force that pushes marginal cost and marginal revenue toward being equal is price adjustment. Ah, it was... I, I redid it from the, the uh, midterm, second midterm last year because people hadn't gotten it well enough. And notice, even on the final, people were having a tough time with this. Please, please get this straight. Uh, price adjustment makes marginal cost equal marginal revenue. Free entry and exit makes average cost equal price. Please, I wanna see, if I put these questions on the final, which now I'm tempted to do, uh, I, I really want you to do better than 60% of you getting this answer right. This is, this is pretty, pretty central. So definitely get these down. And the more I talk about this, the more tempted I am to put this on the final. All right, we may be closer to the end than you think because uh, we had separate lectures on this. So everything on this, these two pages is uh, we did already, uh, wait, not quite, up through, through 24, 21 through 24 we did. Let's go on to 25. Judging from what I said when I recommended a carbon tax in lecture, why does a large share of economists support a carbon tax? Well, it's because a carbon tax uses the magic of the price system to get people to think of good ways to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. What did... What, uh, what is uh, something I, I, I wasn't saying in lecture last year? Carbon tax is easier politically than other kinds of environmental policies. No, we see a lot of other environmental policies. We don't see a carbon tax. Presumably that's because a carbon tax is hard politically. Um, even with current accounting conventions, a carbon tax will increase GDP at all horizons. Well, it'll make us better off. And if we were measuring if instead of GDP, we were measuring uh, economic welfare or, or welfare more generally better, it would increase that. But with current accounting conventions, it would make GDP go down. And so much the worse for GDP. GDP is not a perfect measure. Uh, what else is wrong? A carbon tax is a good way to starve the beast. That is a good way to reduce government revenue so the government doesn't spend too much wealth. It is a tax that raises government revenue rather than reducing it, so that's false. Okay, and we don't need the none of the above or more than one of the above answer. Question 26. In a steady state with population growth and technological progress, the real rental price of capital is constant and the real wage grows at the rate of technological progress. So this is straight out of the chapter, but uh, that's definitely something 
that um, MANQ emphasizes. So this is not something I talked about a ton in lecture, but the, um, but the textbook chapter was um, pretty clear about saying that the, the real rental rate is constant, the real wage grows at the rate of technological progress. Okay, let's see what's not true. Both the real rental price of capital and the real wage are constant. No, nope. technological progress raises the real wage. Both real rental price of capital and real wage grow. No, nope. real rental price of capital is constant. Real rent, uh, real wage is constant. No, nope. he uh, grows at the rate of depreciation. There, there, there. I'm just stretching. It's like oh, I need five possible answers, even if it sounds a little stupid. But there's just not. I don't know why the real rental price of capital would grow at the rate of depreciation. It doesn't. Okay, here's 27 is a simple rule of 70 questions. Suppose China's per capita GDP were growing 10% per year. Well, it's the rule. How many years would it take to double? Well, it's the rule of 70. So it takes seven years of 10% to get to 70%. 70% platonic is a doubling. And fortunately, you can see last year, at least, uh, the rule of 70 was uh, drilled into my students' um, minds well enough that 94% of them got this. Okay. Um, okay, half a percent for 140 40 years. What do you get? Well, half a percent times 140 is 70%, which is one doubling. Okay. Uh, so 140 times 1%, 140 years times 1% per year, that would be two doublings, but this is half a percent for 140 years, which is 70% platonic, which is a doubling. Okay, question uh, 29. In the international finance models we've been using, intentional net capital, capital outflow drives net exports. That was the main emphasis of one whole lecture. Let's see what's not true. Unintentional net capital flow, outflow drives net exports. Uh, uh, unintentional net capital outflow gets reversed pretty quickly. Net exports drives unintentional net capital outflow. Nah, net exports drives intentional net capital outflow. And this is something that uh, one of the current economists in the in the Trump administration believes, but uh, I just don't think it's right. You know, people. Uh, anyway, I, I'm 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 with Mankiw on this, and there's no question that the models we've been using have net exports driven by uh, the the capital flow and not the other way around. Okay, now uh, we really are close to the end because. We did a lot. We did a huge number of these questions about the international finance diagram, uh, both in the short run and the long run, on the other lecture. Let's see if there's anything left. I'm not sure there is anything left. Okay, what else have we got? Uh, ah, uh, we have a little bit left. Let's take a look at question 48. Okay, question 48. Consider a solo growth model with no population growth and no technological progress. And by the way, we're sure to have questions like this on, on the final coming up. If capital shares two thirds and technology A improves by 1%, then steady state output per worker increases by closest to. And, and so what do you need to do? Look, I've got these formulas. I've got the, and, and they were in the, online exercise for this too, but you need to know these formulas. Log Y star equals one over one minus alpha log A, alpha plus alpha over one minus alpha log S, minus alpha over one minus alpha log delta. You need to know that formula. Once you know that formula, it's just plugging in, okay? And you need to know this formula for log K star. Now, you might just know how to derive it, and you can derive it at the you know, when you need it on the final exam. So it's, that's even better in many ways if you know how to derive these formulas. Uh, in fact, I'd love to have you know how to derive these formulas, but you certainly need to either know how to derive these formulas or you need to memorize them. You need this formula for log k star as well. 
uh, now what's the you know these are somewhat similar formulas except for log k star it's one over one minus alpha for all of them well obviously you need the minus sign depreciation is bad for both k and k star and y star uh, but here you have one over one minus alpha times log technology but alpha over one minus alpha for the others again i'm assuming you know the minus sign so <clears throat> once you know these you just plug them in and um and you know again ideally you'd know how to derive these and uh you know i think i do that in various places okay now the other thing you need to know is let's uh, is how to deal with changes in S and delta. And that we can see on this page. Okay, so I said just plug in, but finding the percent change in S is a little tricky. So how do we find the percent change in the saving rate S? Well, it goes from 20% to 21%. I did a, I did a short, but short, but entire online lecture on this. You just have, you ignore these percent signs, then you do natural log of 0.21 over 0.2. And you know, there's this formula that the natural log of one plus of the quantity one plus X is approximately X as long as X is really small. Okay, so logarithm of open parenthesis one plus X close parenthesis is approximately equal to X as long as x is small. That's what we're using here. Let's see if we, oh, oh, and notice that typically I ask one question about y star, another question about k star. So you need to pay close attention to, this is about steady state output per worker. This is about steady state capital per worker. I, I like to do questions where it's kind of one change, one comparative static change, but then I ask you about different aspects of it. Um, okay, so again, 20 to 21%. Boy, I'm unimaginative about my uh, uh, changes in rates, but the, oh, except all the same change in the saving rate. Then I just changed the other parameters. Okay, I, I think I'll probably change things up more on the coming final. Anyway, that's it for, talk, for talking you through uh, last year's final exam. But remember, this year's final exam will, will have questions like those on last year's second midterm, as well as those on last year's final. Uh, you'll know exactly what kinds of, not exactly, but you'll know quite well what kind of questions are on the final because I'll, I'll, I'll give you a shell like I have before. Um, yeah, I'm unlikely to do questions like about those changes in relation to the chapter three model, for example, even though, though those were on last year's second midterm. And, and the reason last year's second midterm figures in is because I really rearranged things in the course to, to try to, you know, because I knew given this lockdown that it was going to be easier to do an, an, an essay midterm and, uh, and kind of figure out things like examity uh, later. And so I also then kind of rearranged things to do material that I thought would be good to do on an essay midterm. So because of the coronavirus lockdown, I rearranged the order in the class quite a bit. T content of the class hasn't changed much since uh, a year ago, but the which things went first uh, changed quite a bit. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening to all of these online lectures. Good luck on the upcoming, uh, the upcoming final, and definitely contact me if you want to do office hours. Uh, uh, this is, as far as I know, this is the last online lecture for this, for this course but uh, you'll, you'll see more messages and possibly a couple more readings uh, that I'll send you emails about and, and post on the course website. Um, 
Yeah, I hope you all stay safe. Bye.